Hey guys, so I got up super early this morning. I wanted to um, attend the Johnny Depp Amber Heard trial again, as I have been doing, so I can provide coverage from you guys from inside the courtroom. Um, but today I got there uh, the same time I usually get there to get a limited number of wristbands. And for some reason today, there was a ton of people that showed up. So I just missed it and I did not get in today. So I figured, um, I might as well take the time to make a little video um, about Amber Heard and the terror of borderline women. Um, hopefully I'll be able to get back in tomorrow because I think she's going to be testifying soon and that is something that I think we all would like to see, but I would like to see in person. So I'll be getting there even earlier tomorrow, probably at like 5.45 or 6 o'clock in the morning. Um, because that's how early people have been camping out and stuff. It wasn't like that the first three weeks, so hopefully I have better luck next time. But I wanted to um, bring up who we are referring to as Dr. Mommy. This is Dr. Sharon Curry. This is the psychologist who diagnosed Amber Heard as borderline and histrionic, um, because borderline women are insane. Alone, you'd integrate other data. Yeah. How did you administer the MMPI 2 to Ms. Hurd? I provided her the test on an iPad. She essentially had her own little desk area and then an iPad. She hits start, it provides her with the instructions, and then the it gives her 567 statements in order. For each one, she taps true or false. Okay, so this is Dr. Mommy. Dr. Mommy here, Sharon Curry is talking about how she administered the test to Amber Heard uh, and how she was able to diagnose her. So Amber Heard went through this, uh, I think it was five or 600 different questions. And based on the score, that's how she was able to determine her diagnosis. What did you learn about Ms. Heard from the results of the MMPI-2? Quite a bit. I um, I wrote up a 25-page interpretation outline. Um, it has numerous, numerous scales. So one of the reasons I like this measure so much is that it can tell you so much about multiple different traits and tendencies and mental issues. Um, one of the primary things I learned was that um, she had a very uh, sophisticated way of minimizing any personal problems. Oh yeah. So of course, people like that, they don't there's no self-reflection really. Like there's no accountability for any of their actions. Anything bad that happens to them is obviously somebody else's fault. And clearly they're always right. So that should sound familiar. And you know, I think that it's very sad. <laughs> A lot of the these are red flags, guys. If you come across stuff like this, do not have the blinders on or the rose-colored glasses. Um, you'll hear she kind of goes through the symptoms and stuff. We're not going to play this entire thing, obviously, but there are certain things I wanted to get in here, and then we're going to talk about BPD more. Um, I also learned that she tends to... Uh, well, there were a number of characteristics that were consistent with the eventual diagnoses, but... Um, some of the primary characteristics, and I'm going to try to condense 25 pages here, were essentially um, externalization of blame. Okay, so uh, she's incredibly manipulative, Amber Heard is. And uh, what she's describing here, she's trying to uh, very briefly summarize um, her behavior, right? And I think that this is something that's interesting because there was another uh, therapist that Amber Heard was seeing who I think she had uh, totally fold, right? She Because she is an actress, um, but she I don't think she's a good actress. However, she can be incredibly manipulative. And I think if you are around her in person, she might be able to hold that power over you more. I think the psych other psychologist who kind of disagreed with Dr. Curry, I believe he was a man. And I think that Amber Heard is very good at manipulating members of the opposite sex. Uh, tending to have a lot of inner hostility that is attempted to be controlled. Um, a tendency to be very self-righteous, but to also deny that self-righteousness and to judge others um, critically 
uh, again. Oh, okay. So yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. She's never wrong. She's always right. You know, we heard a lot of this stuff coming out in the audio clips that we've heard of her arguing with Johnny Depp. She's constantly like beating him down and acting like she is never in the wrong, right? It's always him. Like, Johnny, why do you do this? Johnny, why do you do that? Minimizing any of her own responsibility for their uh, fighting and their toxic relationship. It was always put on to him. She is never wrong. She makes herself a victim, even though she's the one instigating uh, most of the fights. Against these sort of high standards for moral value, but also to deny doing that, essentially to, to claim that one is uh, uh, very non-judgmental and accepting and yet very full of rage, really. Very full of rage, really. Oh, you know, gee, maybe to the point of severing someone's finger, putting out a cigarette on their face, taking a dump in their bed, and then painting the walls with that turd. And um, and these aren't facts, but the, her scores essentially correlated. So they were consistent with other people who obtain these scores who have been shown through many, many, many studies to have these very specific traits. So externalization of blame, um, a lot of inner anger and hostility, sometimes that anger among these groups with similar scores, these people might have that anger kind of explode out. At yeah, explosive rage to the point where when you're fighting with someone, like Johnny said, she would follow him from room to room, just sort of berating him. The marriage counselor talked about her jackhammer style of speech, where it's just bah, 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 not letting Johnny get a word in edgewise. That is what these people do. And that inner rage and hostility, uh, resentment, um, explodes at times when they are not getting their way, sort of like a petulant child, right? You know, she she would explode and blow up, and that's how you have things happening where she's throwing bottles of vodka. For a normal person, it's probably hard to wrap your mind around how they can flip a switch like that and go from seemingly normal to all of a sudden they're screeching at you. They are hounding you from room to room they're throwing pots and pans at one point he uh, she admitted to doing that in an audio conversation her and johnny depp were having when they talked about their arguments and she says oh throwing pots and pans isn't the same as punching you and then she said well i was hitting you but i wasn't punching you so again minimizing as dr curry says at times they tend to be very passive aggressive they may be self-indulgent, very self-centered. Um, they uh, could use manipulation tactics to try to get their needs met. Very needy. <laughs> look at the look on her face, too. Look at Amber's face as Dr. Curry is describing this. You know, it's almost as if she knows. But you can see that, that resentment, that hostility, that rage on her face. Attention. Uh, as this is being discussed, you know, how she's got that sm almost smug look on her, you know, um, because Dr. Curry can see her for exactly what she is, how they display that superficial charm, but there's nothing really of substance within them. They don't have a strong identity, so they're constantly mimicking other people or they're trying to play a character. And acceptance, approval, um... They tend to uh, distance people who are close to them. Initially, they may seem very charming. They're very socially sophisticated, actually. Yes, very socially sophisticated. She had Elon Musk fold. You know, Elon Musk was offering to provide her like 24 hour security because he bought her bullshit that Johnny was abusing her. You know, she's an absolute psychopath. And I think that it's important for people to recognize that female psychopathy is a thing. Women can be predators, just as men can be victims of domestic abuse and domestic violence. And that's something that, you know, I think people don't perhaps understand. There's this tendency to believe all women and all of this nonsense. And that's all it is, is nonsense. That was a major component on there. Um, they have a capacity to kind of offer some of their faults, but uh, in a way, but only the ones that people 
think of lightly and can all relate to. And so they can present as very fair and balanced, but in actuality, they really might uh, uh, be very judgmental of others. And yeah, pretending to be vulnerable, right? This is something that they do. They want you to empathize with them and they want you to feel a sense of connection with them. So they will kind of, oh yeah, these are some of my flaws, you know, pretending to be vulnerable when they're really not. It would just be things that the average person would be able to pick up on uh, very easily. So they're, they're pretending to be almost humble in a way. Oh, I'm being vulnerable. I'm being humble by telling you about my flaws or something like that, but that's not really what they're doing. They're trying to provide a false sense of security around them or, or that they're being honest with you or you're, con they're, you're having a moment together, you're connecting. That's not really what's happening though. It's all part of their manipulation. And people like this can be very, very cunning. Unaware of problems in their behavior and their thinking. So after you uh, provide the, the examination by, by the iPad, what do you do? So once they've completed- Okay, so we'll skip past this. Um... On because sometimes an examinee might tell you they're completely fine when you're doing your interview with them and that they have no symptoms. And then when they take the test, it says that they're having trouble sleeping or they struggle with nausea. Okay, so she talks about how some of them try to say that there's nothing wrong with them. Then they go through the questionnaire and you find out that, yes, in fact, there is something wrong with them. It has shown that certain people will have certain scores that kind of spike on this, okay? And so all of those traits that I were descri was describing... Those are traits that are found in these code types, so it means that Okay, so she's explaining the different code types and what that means. A lot of that anger is expressed in this code type. Um, there can be actually a lot of cruelty. Cruelty. Uh, usually and anger. Or less powerful. Uh, actually, when you see this code type, you want to, if you can, to follow up with subordinates. Yeah, so that's interesting. People like with Amber's code type display a lot of cruelty and anger, but they direct that at people that are less powerful than them. Kind of the way that Amber Heard treated her assistant. Kate James testified how Amber Heard was cruel to her and mean to her and degraded and humiliated her, got into her face screaming and was spitting in her face. But Amber would not do that to someone who had more wealth and power than her. In that case, she turn on the charm. So it's sort of like they'll be very cruel and abusive if they feel they can get away with it, if they have power over you. I find that to be incredibly disgusting. Coworkers, people who may have observed their behavior more closely. The three six code type is very concerned with their image, um, very attention seeking. Uh, very prone to externalizing blame to okay so very concerned with their image their appearance uh you know very superficial very shallow um and of course externalizing blame not taking any responsibility for their own behavior and actions the point where uh it's unclear whether they can even admit to themselves that they do have responsibility in certain areas yeah, that's very sad, but not surprising. Stability. It's instability, and it's instability in personal relationships. It's instability in their emotions. It's instability in their behavior, and it's instability in their sense of self and their identity. So she's talking about what characterizes the borderline person, and it is sort of instability is the main thing. Emotional instability, as she said, they don't have a strong identity, so they're constantly unstable and in a way almost looking for other people to regulate their emotions and that instability is really driven by this underlying terror of abandonment and this is something that e even the marriage counselor talked about with amber heard her to her fear that johnny was going to leave her and her desire to control to have that control um, you know, they, they're terrified that they're going to be abandoned, but in a way they almost, their behavior makes that happen. It's like a self-fulfilling prophecy. So one of the key features also of this disorder, and you, you, 
all of it is like pistons of an engine kind of firing off and igniting one another. But when somebody is afraid of being abandoned by their partner or by anybody else in their environment and they have this disorder, they'll make desperate attempts to prevent that from happening. And those desperate attempts could be physical aggression, it could be threatening, it could be harming themselves. But these are behaviors that are usually very extreme and very concerning to the people around them. Yeah. Um, uh, the anger is typically what, sadly, it's counteractive, right? So the thing these people fear most is being abandoned, but over time, the anger, the explosive anger that they show when somebody is... Yeah, so this is what I just said. They're, they're like making it happen. Be the, the exact thing that they fear the most, they make happen because they're unable to control their behavior. They're unable to, in the moment, like stop when they've been triggered and recognize that like they're the ones causing this to happen, that they're making it happen. They're so terrified that someone's going to abandon them that they they lash out at that person if they feel threatened you know th they'll threaten them they'll tr maybe even threaten to harm themselves they it's like anything they can think of to try to manipulate that person into not leaving that is what causes people to want to leave uh needing space or when somebody's really not doing anything wrong because a lot of times they read into things that they perceive as being a slight to them or being somebody intending to harm them that actually isn't happening, they'll exaggerate it um, and they'll explode. They'll react in this heightened manner that is just exhausting for their partners. Oftentimes their partners will uh, try to make them happy at first. and Yeah, they try to placate them because it's like they probably haven't <laughs> experienced that kind of behavior before and they don't know what to do. So they're like, oh, I just better try to please this person. And we see this with Johnny Depp in, in the story of their relationship, how in the beginning he thought he could placate her. He would agree with her to kind of get her to shut up and to stop. But then it becomes exhausting. It's a c constant battles, constant fights. And she has to win all the time. Nobody wants to be around that really allow themselves to be a punching bag thinking that they can somehow solve this problem that oh yeah i can save her you cannot save her you can't change these kinds of people and so it does because it's like you're being terrorized constantly somehow they can make this better and eventually it just overwhelms them yeah you'll be overwhelmed by it because you can't save her you can't fix her so just briefly, I want to uh, read something about the borderline personality. This was uh, written by Donna Anderson talking about um, borderline personality as being very similar to sort of a sociopath, right? It says, it is not unusual in my clinical experience to see sometimes some quite chilling sociopathic activity from my borderline personality disorder BPD clients. When someone has a borderline personality, it's quite likely, among other things, that he or she will present with a history of emotional instability, a pattern of chaotic interpersonal relationships and poor coping skills under stress reflected in self-destructive, destructive acting out and tendency to suicidal behaving. These unstable trends are not explained by a core psychotic orientation, although individuals with BPD can sometimes lapse into psychotic thinking when feeling hurt and rejected enough. Uh, by the way, I will put the link to this in the video description. Borderline personalities tend to see others in black and white thinking, so either all good or all bad. They also idealize people in the beginning, then they devalue them. They love bomb. They do a lot of things that um, narcissists do. They struggle to retain more flexible, ambivalent views of others. Others are either idealized or devalued. These swings of perception, like flipping a switch, can be sudden, volatile, and complete. Perceptions and or experiences of abandonment often elicit the borderline's dysfunctional responses and psychological deterioration. 
in his or her more stable state, the borderline can sometimes function well and appear to be well-adjusted, but more intimate involvement with them over time will expose an underlying poorly disturbed sense of self and an incapacity for mature relating to other people. So in the beginning, if you're not having a lot of interaction with somebody who's a borderline, they might appear normal to you. In fact, they might even appear as really charming, really fun, um, a nice person, right? But as you get to know them more, that they can't maintain that mask. So the mask eventually falls and you end up seeing who they really are basically over time. So... You know, I find that interesting, especially when you think about Amber Heard and her relationships with people like James Franco, Elon Musk, uh, Jason Momoa, these people who maybe initially thought, you know, bought into her bullshit and then realized what she was. A question I found myself considering is when the borderline personality is acting and looking like a sociopath, is it the case that he or she is in these states effectively a sociopath? It should be noted that behaviors per se are never sociopathic, only the individuals perpetrating them. Sociopathy is a mentality from which antisocial exploitative behaviors gestate and emanate with a destructive historical chronicity, but one can infer the presence of the sociopathic mentality from a telling pattern of behaviors. Clearly, there are fundamental differences between borderline personalities and sociopaths, differences which I appreciate. At the same time, when the borderline's rage or desperation is evoked, one sees, and not rarely, responses that can closely correspond to the sociopath's calculating, destructive mentality. So as I'm reading this, just consider Amber Heard and all that we've learned about her so far. Once inside this mentality, I'm suggesting that borderline individuals uh, can lapse into a kind of transient sociopathy, commonly victims of the borderline's aberrant, vicious behaviors will sometimes react along the lines of, what's wrong with you? Are you some kind of freaking psychopath? They'll say this from the experience of someone who really has just been exploited as if by a psychopath. Because this isn't the borderline personality's default mentality, it is the sociopath's. Several psychological phenomena must occur. I think to enable the temporary descent into sociopathy. He or she must regress in some way, dissociate in some fashion, and experience a form of self-fragmentation, for instance, in response to a perceived threat, like that of abandonment. You know, when you're thinking about what would cause Amber to do some of the things she's done, think about that. These preconditions, I suggest, see the borderline's collapse into the primitive altered states of self that can explain, among other phenomenon, his or her chilling and necessary suspension of empathy. This gross suspension of empathy supports his or her evening the score against the so-called victimizer with the sociopath's remorseless sense of entitlement. Okay, so does that sound <laughs> does that sound familiar? So she gives an example here. She says, I worked not long ago with a man, 24, who slit his ex-girlfriend's tires in the parking lot of a restaurant in which she tended bar. He'd suspected her of cheating with her manager. Notably, they were still together at the time of his act. Although his girlfriend surmised his guilt, he wouldn't admit it, suggesting foolishly that the perpetrator was probably the manager. While his suspicions of her infidelity had some basis, the important point is that they activated an inner self-crisis and desperation characteristic of borderline structures. Specifically, he feared losing her, a prospect so traumatic that rage was summoned to help mobilize his fragmenting self. His rage was experienced as cold, not volatile. But think about Amber Heard. She did both. Cold, like recording Johnny Depp when he's vomiting in the bathroom, going through opiate detox, 
and she would also display volatile rage, like severing his finger. He regressed into paranoia as one who had been betrayed and cruelly left helpless. His failure to soberly examine the circumstances and his inflammatory reactions represented a form of mild dissociation and de detachment from reality that enabled the paranoid experience and processing of his fear. His detachment and regression enabled him to formulate and execute his revenge with his empathy and guilt conveniently iced so they won't feel guilt or remorse during the time that they are, you know, doing something horrific to you. L like, you know, for Amber Heard, making false accusations of domestic violence, something that could ruin a man's life, an innocent man's life, and then continuing with that lie, adding on to it, building it even more, continuing like we're seeing now up to today where we're in court for this, okay? So we're talking about criminal allegations against somebody. In other words, he could perpetrate his vengeance with the detached calm of someone who has experienced a trauma as in a state of depersonalization. Upon emerging from this state, it would be as if emerging from a sort of dream or a seizure, the rationalization would kick in. What I do in those states really isn't me, so I don't have to take responsibility for it later on. It's as if the borderline individual surfaces from a dip in dissociopathy, once again, a borderline and no longer a sociopath. Motives that drive patterns of problematic behaviors frequently illuminate and distinguish the personality disorders. In this case, what seems to have driven my client was his crumbling sense of self in the form of an inarticulate terror of being abandoned. For this reason, I can confidently say he wasn't a sociopath, but when he was in that regressed, dissociated, fragmented state for as long as it lasted, I suggest he was. So I think that we see kind of the same thing um, with Amber Heard. Uh, now, there's another one that another article I just want to read from 10% uh, of uh, U.S. women have a borderline personality disorder. 85% um, of people that's, that have BPD are women and account for about 5% of the U.S. population. This gentleman talked about his wife suffering from BPD. He says, having lived through it, I can tell you that the end result is a battered, beaten shadow of a man who, at his lowest, believes every harsh thing she says about him has lost complete control over his own possessions and even his own life and feels isolated and trapped. Think about that. Does that describe what happened to Johnny Depp? I suggest it does. <laughs> um, he's... Quote, I've just read your brief article about dangerous people with BPD. My wife is this kind of dangerous person. It's taken me many years to understand who she is. Since we separated four years ago, she has caused me more grief than I can describe here. I could write a book. She is the narcissistic, powerful personality type who won't stop torturing me. Are there any resources I can access to deal with her? I'm chained to her during a very prolonged divorce because she and her lawyer find ways to block the divorce property settlement that keeps my life in limbo. Thanks for your help in understanding this kind of dangerous person. Very disturbing. Quote, sometimes in the middle of the night, Bobby would awake to find Mary standing over his bed, beating him. According to the affidavit, Bobby tried to protect himself from her punches and even once jumped out of a second story window to escape, unquote. The last days of Mary Kennedy. <laughs> Very disturbing. Um, that's really sad. Um, on May 16th, 2012, Mary Richardson Kennedy, the estranged wife of Robert Kennedy Jr., was found dead hanging in the family barn in what the police ruled a suicide 
The mass media and feminists immediately started attacking Robert Kennedy Jr., saying he had given her a devastating blow when he filed for divorce two years prior. As the days went on, the character assassination campaign grew to such a pitch, Mr. Kennedy publicized a court affidavit from their divorce proceedings that described Mary as an out-of-control woman who frequently physically and emotionally abused her loving husband and four children. According to the affidavit, quote, Mary... In a sudden rage about my continued friendship with my ex-wife Emily hit me in the face with her fist. She was a trained boxer and I got a shiner. Her engagement ring crushed my tear duct, causing permanent damage. Mary asked me to lie to her family about the cause of my black eye. Unquote. Now think about what Amber did severing Johnny's finger and then Johnny lying about it and saying, I cut my finger off to try to protect her. It's so similar, guys. It's disturbing. According to the affidavit and various psychologists, Mary Kennedy had BPD. She appears to have had what clinicians call a high-functioning form, meaning that from the outside, everything looks normal, even optimal. But for those intimate with her, she took on the Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde personas that is so typical of BPD. Quote, um... Yeah, okay, I don't want to read that quote, actually. Personality disorders in general are deeply ingrained, learned behaviors and mindsets formed during childhood that result in the individual ceasing to mature emotionally. The sufferer has an extremely narrow black and white worldview that causes them to be unduly agitated and aggressive. Personality disorders are contrasted against the more commonly known affective disorders like bipolar and depression in that PDs are mostly learned behavior and mindsets, whereas affective disorders stem from more biological malfunctions and shortages of hormones or a chemical imbalance. Bobby couldn't understand what was happening to this beautiful woman he adored. She would be fine during the day, but when he but he came to dread the evenings. She would go into a kind of altered state, which we came to call her episodes. Bobby said in his affidavit, her features would change with her jaw set forward, her face paled, her eyes notably darkened, her voice alternately breathy or hard. Mary's mood vacillated between rage and self-pity. Her behavior often became violent and destructive. People afflicted with BPD typically have an emotional maturity level somewhere between that of a three and six-year-old. They tend to not be able to settle conflicts, instead raging, cannot emotionally handle information conflicting to their beliefs of reality, instead growing immediately and intensely angry, have a weak handle on reality at times, forgetting past abuse, having warped views of situations, and have the inability to hold two opposing views and finding a synthetic balance. Someone or something is either all good or in the words of Mary Kennedy, the devil incarnate. This is the psychological process called splitting. If you find yourself frequently thinking, gosh, they're acting just like a spoiled brat, there may be some very real truth to that statement. But imagine a mentally unstable Tom Hanks in the movie Big, and you will quickly realize this is no laughing matter. On her last day, Mary Kennedy split her own self black, as they say, but this can easily and does go the other way. Everyone from husbands to children of the beloved family pet can be split black by the borderline, sometimes with disastrous results. Just over a year ago, in May 2011, Mrs. Kennedy ran over the family dog with her car when her 11-year-old son sent, said he wanted to go to his dad's house. That is very sad. One of the saddest aspects of BPD pattern is that most husbands of BPDs are honest, God-fearing, highly empathetic, and otherwise powerful men. Frankly, no one could put up with that abuse or have faith that they get better because highly functioning BPDs can control themselves in front of outsiders. Many go months, even years, without showing symptoms. By the, that point, the unsuspecting man frequently finds himself married and with several children. There is a pattern where borderline women desire numerous children as a sort of narcissistic supply and enmeshment of husbands. 
these men then feel like they committed to the relationship for better or worse and doggedly stick to their convictions, even while it destroys their manhood and or their children. Then a series of systematic abuse, isolation from friends and family, and an invasion of their personal boundaries occurs that leaves the partner in a state of psychological shock and blackmailed, blackmail termed enmeshment. Think about Johnny Depp, his, he, how he didn't leave her. He stuck with her, right? He tried to make it work. Um, some nights she would threaten suicide, but the next morning she would be calm and gentle. She would then say she was sorry. She didn't know why she was acting that way. For a time, she could be her old wonderful self at night as well as during the day. And Bobby had renewed hope, the affidavit said. that It's so sad because it is so similar to what Johnny Depp has described and what other people who were there to witness some of uh, this behavior have sort of described when it comes to Amber Heard. And so I think that that's interesting. You know, I had my own personal run-in with a borderline woman. I'm not going to name this person, but she was a young girl. She is somebody that has been passed around the America First crowd. And uh, she was extremely flirtatious with my husband. And um, I tried to be nice to her. You know, I took her shopping to get a dress. We went to this event together. And her behavior, she was super, like, hyper. Um, she would be, like, laughing and having a good time one minute, the next minute, crying about her life and how sad it was. Um, hypersexual, you know, uh, she had a complete breakdown and unfortunately live streamed it and it was all over 4chan and people were like making fun of her. And I think she was, she had threatened to kill herself all the time. Um, and it's very sad. You know, it's like a, they're, they're, they're like children in an adult's body. And so I hope that that young lady has gotten help. But um, when you, when you see somebody like that, that is displaying that kind of uh, those mood swings and the weird emotional behavior. You don't walk away, you run away. <laughs> so yeah, that is the terror of women with borderline personality disorder. Run.